I don't know, I know you guys are very smart, but if you feel like your brain is about to explode with all the information you've had so far, it's perfectly normal because it's an incredibly complex sector to get your head around. I've been working with Alix on this sector for over a year now, and every single day I have those moments where it's like, ah, oh, I get it now. <laughs> but you don't get it because tomorrow you're going to have the exact same feeling when you learn something new. So it's incredibly complicated, and we've just... Um, highlighted three reasons for why it's particularly complicated. So um, as Dora was explaining with the, the many different types of flags and states involved, uh, it's a very, very, very transnational industry to manage. So you can have a fisher from country A that's recruited by an agency in country B to fly to country C to get on board a vessel that's flagged by country D, owned by country E, uh, but the captain that he works for is from country F, then they go and fish in, I'm going to forget the alphabet, but country G. <laughs> then they go to the port in country H, where they then offload and export to country, what letter was I at? I. I. <laughs> so trying to manage all of that is incredibly difficult. Um, first and foremost, the principle is that the flag is the main country mm -hmm. responsible. So the flag state is the main country responsible. However, um, the convention C-188 that Charles just talked about um, gives, it doesn't obligate states to inspect foreign flagged vessels that come into their port, but it gives them the option to if they want. Um, and there are other uh, conventions like the port state, um, what's called port measure. state? Measure agreement of the, of FAO that um, obligates states, in fact, to um, those that have ratified to inspect foreign flagged vessels. So that kind of opened the door to make it easier for port state actors to come in and inspect labor conditions uh, on board. But in general, I think it's fair to say that actually everyone is responsible for labor rights, um, particularly businesses with the rise of due diligence legislation. Now uh, the responsibility is spreading to all of us. Um, Isolation. So, um, because of, and this comes, uh, this is connected to the third point actually with declining fish stocks, because of climate change and overfishing, uh, vessels are finding themselves in situations where they have to fish further out to sea uh, for longer periods. They have to go deeper, they have to do more offloads of the nets and more catches basically per day to get the exact same amount of fish that they used to get in quite easily without going too far from shore. So just to give one example, it's not even an extreme case. When we were in Cape Town, we met a fisher who was probably in a situation of forced labor. He d his contract had ended months before um, and his <coughs> captain was keeping hold of his passport so that he couldn't get off the ship. He hadn't been paid in months. Um, on that vessel, we took a picture that we'll show you on the last slide in this presentation. Um, someone had written on the wall, started on this vessel 2021, will go home 2023. So having spending two years on board the same vessel is not even extreme. That's actually quite normal. So the isolation means that fishers are for most of that period, unable to send any grievances to any port authorities, any union on land. They have no connectivity. Uh, we're potentially gonna work with um, one company called Geeks Without Borders that are trying to uh, make those devices that allow for access to the internet on vessels a lot cheaper and accessible. Um, but it's a dream that may come into uh, play in a few years' time. For now, fishers find themselves in situations where they simply cannot raise the alarm. Um, declining fish stocks, I've already explained. Um, so that's in general, they're the challenges in general. And then when it comes to port inspectors that we work with quite a lot, um, they still have their own challenges. So even when you have the political will for a port authority that has ratified C-188 to go on board a vessel and do an inspection, they still face challenges. And these are these three. So the sheer number of vessels that come into port. In Cape Town, there are over 300 per year foreign flagged vessels that come into port. The South African Maritime Safety Authority is responsible for inspecting not just those, but all of the national fleet, all of the um, 
shark diving boats that tourists use. Like they're responsible for a hell of a lot more than just this area. And so the numbers can be really overwhelming. Uh, they have many things to inspect, so when they do go on board, they do have to check the safety, the labor conditions, whether that vessel has uh, an exclusive economic zone permit, whether they've been involved in IUU fishing, um, and also the visa problem. So this particular fisher that I just mentioned who was potentially in a situation of forced labor, one of the main obstacles was that his visa, his transit visa for South Africa had expired. And that was the excuse that the captain was using to keep him on board, to cook for him, for the months that they were waiting for a new flag to take over before they could set sail again. So there are many, many different things that they have to look at in each inspection. And they have limited human resources. And labor inspectors tend not to be so involved in uh, labor inspections on board fishing vessels. They tend to leave it to the port authorities who are more they have more expertise when it comes to safety than labor rights, so working hours, uh, contract issues, that kind of thing. Um, what's the next slide? That's it. Was As there you, another question, actually? On the thing? If, you go, if you go on, you know, I just put on the next slide sort of a summary of the many issues that could affect you as a, a person working on a fishing vessel. You know, the typical human rights challenges refer to health and safety. I once heard that, of course, it's hardcore manual labor, and if you have cuts on a fishing vessel and you work in salt water all the time, your cuts never heal. <laughs> okay. Doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> that oh, that's statistic the, is quite important. That point first, out, can you actually explain it, Alison? Because uh, yeah, so yeah. there was um, a study that came out. I think it was last year. This one. Yeah. Uh, that showed that there were a hundred thousand fishing-related deaths the previous year yeah. worldwide. There are only around 300 deaths per year in the shipping industry. So we cannot blame the waves and the weather yeah. for these deaths. Right. It's actually quite correlated with the number of ratifications of C-188 oh, yeah. and the number of ratifications of the Maritime Labour Convention that Charles showed you on the previous slide. So it shows that if you work on a ship, it doesn't have to be a dangerous activity because, well, in the shipping industry, the deaths are significantly lower compared to the fishing. I mean, they're different yeah. types of vessels, but yeah. it just gives you an idea of the attention yeah. paid to shipping line, people who work in shipping, mm. shipping and fishing. Yeah. And then you already mentioned privacy and communication. So we've seen in the video how workers live in very tight, you know, living quarters, um, and then they have no connectivity. So to file a grievance, if something, if there's abuse happening on the ship, they have to wait a year to come back to a port to maybe have access, but. Um, that's a problem that they are really isolated at sea. Then hours and wages, you know, they are so well regulated for, let's say, facilities on land. But if, if, if fish is coming through, I think some of those fishermen actually work 30 hours straight because this is when the fish is there. So regulating working hours on such a, for an activity that, you know, I mean, you cannot regulate the fish. <laughs> so fish is moving around, the vessels are moving around. When they meet fish, they have to fish. And they have to fish until um, the, the fish is dried up. Um, so it's very common to have incredibly long working hours uh, on those vessels. Isolation and time at sea, Alison mentioned already. Uh, apparently it's normal to be sometimes out for a year or a couple of years because of the fishing conditions where you have to be further out and um, yeah, rarer come to land. And now over to Alex, because the last point is really the key issue for our session today, trafficking and forced labor and fishing. And as I said, uh, you're the expert for that. Um, <laughs> I'll move you on. Indeed, um, Thank you. explain how, why fishing and uh, forced labor are such key concerns. So I think uh, you've seen already uh, quite a lot of the indicators of forced labor as we name them. You know, very long hours, very low pay, isolation, uh, retention of passports. Uh, 
that's that give you a bit of a flavor of what is forced labor but as we are talking about forced labor i think in this in this course today it's important to understand also what it is exactly that we mean by forced labor um, uh, because nowadays it's a key risk for business it's one of the really top risk in fact for business and that's why you have the development for example at the eu level of this draft uh, new regulation on banning any products that come to the EU market that would have been made out of forced labor. So it's a big deal. I mean, it's really at the top of the of the political agenda in Europe and also worldwide. And at the ILO, um, I don't know if you are very familiar with the ILO, and I invite you to come and grab a coffee with us if uh, you know at some point you want to learn more. Um, but we are one of the only um, uh, law setting agency of the UN. So all the international labor convention, it's, it's set at the ILO by governments, by workers and by employers. Uh, and um, in those many convention, you've heard about convention 188. So you can imagine how many international labor convention there are. It's a very specialized field, uh, lab, international labor law. In those many conventions, there are 10 conventions which we say are fundamental rights, meaning these are the human rights of the labor rights, if you want. Uh, and among those 10 conventions, you have five key topics, where in fact we say even if a state do not ratify those 10 conventions, they still have to report what they do under this convention under a process which we call the, uh, dec the Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work, which is not at all the case for the other convention, where it's only when you ratify that you have to report progress. So in those 10 conventions, in fact, you have um, one topic, which is the elimination of forced labor, which is one of the key five fundamental rights of workers. Um, Forced labor, it's defined into a very old convention, one of the first one of the ILO called Convention 29. I will not go into details, but this definition that dates back, in fact, from 1930 is still valid today. Um, and um, we, I think a lot of, of people, of students, when we speak about forced labor, they, they have this past view that this is linked to slavery, so this is something you can see quite easily. Uh, they, they think about the past forms uh, of coercion uh, in work. But you have to realize that nowadays forced labor is something that you can just go, you know, pass through a construction site here in Geneva, and in fact you have forced labor, you might have forced labor victim. It's something that is very difficult to see uh, that we have to investigate and monitor, and that also happen a lot in developed uh, countries. So it's, it's not only happening uh, in, in developing countries, and we have to, to realize this. So um, we have this convention uh, on forced labor, which basically extracts two elements uh, when we speak about forced labor situation. One is the element of coercion, so you are coerced to do this work, but it's not like, um, you know, slavery-like practices. Uh, it can be coerced because your passport was taken, for example, uh, or because you haven't been paid since 10 months, so, in, you know, and, and the employer will tell you, oh, tomorrow you will be paid. So they are coercing you and staying in the job by basically retaining your wages. And you have another element, what we call involuntariness, which is often people are deceived into jobs, especially when you look at migrant fishers, for example, they would be recruiting by agencies, by private recruitment agencies that would tell them, oh, I have a job for you in fishing in Indonesia. Uh, in fact, the salary will be this. These are the working hours. Uh, this is when you will come back. And in fact, when the person arrives in the job, he realizes that it's not at all the working condition that were promised. This is what we call deception. Uh, you know, contract deception, and it's quite difficult to, to exit those situations because some of those migrant fishers, you have to realize it's extremely low pay. It's one of the lowest paid jobs 
in the world. So when you have paid $1,000 recruitment fees, you arrive on a vessel, it takes you an, a year and a half just to repay your recruitment fees. And then you're able to earn money, pay a ticket back home. So it's very, um, I think we have to, you know, uh, sometimes realize that people live in very different conditions than us. Something that would not be perceived for us as coercion or deception is very real uh, for some workers on this planet. We have those 11 indicators of forced labor. This is what the ILO developed uh, in order to distill, if you want, a bit the definition. And this is what we, what we tell businesses, what we tell labor inspectorates. This is what you have to look for to see if you might be in a situation of forced labor. So this includes what we call the abuse of vulnerability, often you know, in migration situation when the person does not speak the local language, has the passport retained, it's very easy to uh, use the vulnerability of the person. Intimidation and threats, you know, threats to family back home in the situation of migrant fishers or violence. Deception, this is what I just explained, contract deception, a lot of selling of dreams, which end up being not at all the case. Restriction of movement is de facto in the fishing industry because of the isolation also. Withholding of wages is one of the biggest uh, coercive practices used by unscrupulous employers to retain people in a job. Uh, especially in fishing, as Alison explained, often fishers stay for a very long time at sea, meaning that uh, you know, if you do not get your wages after 11, 12 months, uh, that's a major re reason for you to, to continue to stay in the job because you think that, okay, next month you will have your wages. And it's such a big investment of time that in fact it, it prompts you just to stay in the job. Physical and sexual violence, um, unfortunately, in extreme cases. Retention of identity documents. The person that we met, the, the fishers that we met in the port of Cape Town uh, during this pilot inspection with the South African Maritime Authority had their passport retained by the unscrupulous skipper on the vessel, which was even not allowing them to go and seek help from the South African authorities in the port. So this is at this stage where you are on a vessel in the port and you cannot even go and see someone from the authorities because you cannot you know, cross this border in the port. Debt bondage, uh, it's a key indicator of forced labor. This is often linked to recruitment. So you know, normally what the ILO, we have another convention, Convention 181, which sets the rules for um, private employment agencies conduct and which says that uh, normally workers should not pay for their recruitment. You will not pay to get a job after university. You're not going to pay the company to get the job. That's not very logical. Unfortunately, in a lot of low wage occupation in this world, people continue to pay uh, illegal fees for their recruitment, which then puts them in this situation of debt. And you always have to compare what is the fee that the person is paying to get the job and what is the wage that the person will have. Because you know, if you have a very low wage and you pay very high fees, it takes you months to repay those fees. So you have to work to repay. And then lastly, abusive working and living condition and excessive overtime. This is uh, quite common in the fishing industry. We've seen it quite well in the Jan Urbina um, documentary in the beginning, living conditions can be really something. Uh, we visited a lot of vessels with Alison in many different countries, and um, we were extremely, extremely shocked by the living uh, conditions and the working condition. It's extremely tough work. Just to finish on, on forced labor, um, unfortunately, the global picture is not very rosy. And so this, is, this will continue to be a major risk for companies, uh, I think, in the coming years. You can see that at the ILO, we do global estimation of forced labor, so quantitative surveys, if you want, from uh, you know, every five years approximately to really have a better understanding of the situation at the global level and also regional level. And the latest one came out last year and shows, unfortunately, an increase 
in forced labor situation. And all of this increase is driven by private sector imposed forced labor. Because you have also other situations which are state-led, but this increase is led uh, by, by private sector. In this global estimation, because the fishing sector is um, uh, you know, at risk also of forced labor, for the first time, we estimated a separate estimation for the fishing sector that is telling you that at the very minimum, there is 128,000 fishers that are in a situation of forced labor worldwide, but we think that's really an underestimation. It's the first time that we were trying to do the methodology. And it's also a sector, as you can imagine, where it's extremely difficult to collect data. Uh, so in the future, we hope to refine this number to come up really with more uh, reliable uh, data. Um, just to recap, so in fishing, um, if we want to know whether we are in a situation of forced labor, we have to look at two elements. Do I have a, an element of involuntariness? Was the, the fisher deceived by, for example, on, on, um, on his contract? If yes, then I look, do I have an element of coercion? Is the person, does the person have his passport retained? Is the person stuck, isolated on a fishing vessel that is not coming back to shore because it's been several months that it's still on, you know, at sea? If yes, then you are in a situation of forced labor. That's how pretty much, uh, in a nutshell, we measure whether we are in a situation of forced labor. Um, lastly, wanted also to recap. So. At the international level, we have uh, this Convention 188 of the ILO that regulates labor rights of fishers. This is very much linked to how you prevent forced labor uh, and our other convention on forced labor. Because basically, if all the labor rights of fishers were respected, forced labor would not happen. So if you want to work on how, how do we address forced labor, you work on making this a reality for all fishers. And with our Convention 188, all those elements are regulated, if you want. So uh, for states that ratify this convention, they need to have you know, specific working hours that are not abusive, work, specific working conditions, making sure that fishers have an employment contract. This might you know, sound weird, but many, many fishers do not have any employment contract. It's only oral promises. So then you know you have absolutely no legal pieces that can also back you up when you, you know, want to, to seek justice for some of the violations. So it's just to recall what Convention 188 covers. And honestly, recently I've been trying to do with Alison some know your rights. So you know, one thing that the ILO does is to clarify for certain categories of workers, what are your rights? It's one of the most difficult exercises we've ever been doing. It's Usually, a very long document. We want it to be like a one pager, but it's like <laughs> 20 pages. <laughs> it's extremely long, and you realize that it's, you know, normally uh, in national legislation, you have a labor code or a labor law. So it's clear. You look at the labor law, okay, what are my rights in terms of working hours, in terms of annual leave, in terms of this and this, and you have your, know your rights in a day. For fishers, um, it's not at all well regulated in many countries. Uh, sometimes some of those rights are not at all in law, so it's completely vague, completely absent. Uh, most of the time, it, it's in so many different types of regulations, so not only in the labor law, but in the fisheries legislation, in the shipping acts. So extremely complex, even for someone working at the ILO to understand those rights. So you can imagine when you're a fisher, uh, sometimes in illiterate situation, if you want to know your rights and defend your rights in front of employers, good luck. Thank you, Alex. And a final word on like, do you think that the current patchwork structure on the international level, on the regional level, potential import bans on the horizon, how will we effectively close governance gap and, and you know, work towards decent work in the fishing industry? From a company perspective, you know, it, it looks like there's, it's very difficult and what can someone working at L'Oréal or at Nestle actually do and all these international efforts 
paying off and closing gaps. So what is your current assessment where, you know, where are we? Um, where should companies pay particular attention um, because there may be remaining gaps? There are still many, many gaps yeah. uh, on, on this sector, and it's true that it's particularly challenging for companies, uh, I would say especially, for example, multinational here uh, in Europe that are importing fish um, to um, really know exactly what is happening. But there are solutions, and I think we will discuss some of the solution in the, after the break. Um, I think how we have seen that this international convention on work in fishing is quite, uh, I mean, the, the rates of ratifications are still quite low. So we really hope that more countries ratify because it's basically giving you, these are the minimum standards for all your fishing vessels in terms of labor rights. Uh, so I think companies that source fish need also to know where the fish is coming from, um, you know, from which flag of the vessels who are, uh, I mean, who are fishing, they are coming from, because this can also give you a quite a good indication on whether labor rights, you know, are respected on those vessels or not. Uh, and that at least shows commitment from those countries um, to uh, raise the standard and come up uh, in a gradual manner to, um, you know, minimum international requirements. So I would say that that's really something that we, we encourage employers to do, and at the national level, we are seeing, in fact, employers supporting quite a lot, uh, pushing also for the ratification on Convention 188 to also avoid, you know, competitions from vessels where, you know, who would lower wages, lower working conditions, which are, um, you know, 